Hello and welcome to Album Home and to the last edition for 2022. Uh, in this edition I really concentrate on a little project that I undertook over the Christmas period. Uh, at the end of the video I'll give you a brief update on how I'm getting on creating water slide transfers and also show you two little things that I managed to acquire to help me with being able to move the tar away from the gasworks. But first of all, uh, let's go on to my little project that I started over the Christmas holiday. Over the Christmas holidays, I thought it'd be quite nice to do a bit of modeling that was unconnected with the bulk of the work that I'm currently doing around the gasworks. Uh, and so I, I finally got out this kit, which I bought, I think at the same time as I bought the church and the uh, houses that make up Station Road. Now I like petite properties kits, they don't do that many that are 360 degree models. They do a lot of low relief models uh, and I really like them. Um, when I uh, open the instructions for this kit, let me just leave that there. As you can see, it's a very simple kit. There's not very many pieces to it. Uh, the, the bulk of the kit is, is are the side pieces that go together. And then you have a number of pieces that give 3D relief on the front um, to help it make, give the model a, a proper, a decent look. Now in the instructions for the exterior finish, what is suggested is that they use um, brick paper of some kind or other. I'm increasingly um, moving away from using just paper textures. Um, you can get fantastic results with paper textures. If you look at Michael Scott's uh, layout, Charnwell, and the work that he does there, um, absolutely fabulous work, requires a lot of work to get the 3D effect. And so I've been increasingly moving over to using um, the uh, plastic card or strip styrene. And for Harper's Yard, the thought that occurred to me for the building was that actually I think this building would be probably wooden clad. And what I wanted to try to do was to have the effect of a wooden exterior. Now, it so happened in my uh, strip styrene collection, I had several sheets of V-Groove, which is made by Evergreen uh, Styrene. And I thought that would be the very thing. The only trouble is if I get a piece of it here for you, this is the V-Groove. Um, it's very flat and it's a tiny bit shiny. There's a kind of satiny finish on it. Uh, and I wasn't sure just painting it with the uh, Humbrol wood paint, which I normally do, uh, would give me the effect that I wanted. So I hunted around on the internet and looked at how people get a wood effect on plastic art. Uh, and the end result of my efforts is this. Um, I'm really pleased with this and it's been produced with a bit of paint, yes, but principally by using weathering powders. And I thought what I would do for this end of year video is just show you how I got this the wood effect, if I bring it up a bit closer, uh, how I got the wood effect onto the, the strip styrene. Um, I'll, I'll put up here uh, a better uh, look at the model itself so you can see what, what the thing looks like when it's finished. Uh, I did nearly, should you wish to make this model, just give you this tip. I very nearly made a huge boo-boo. Um, when I was preparing the model, uh, uh, if I put up here I, a picture which shows all the various bits of the model, and I had already, as you can see on the two end walls, stuck on some very fine detailing which gives lintels and um, window sills and also two upright supports for the uh, frame around the garage doors. But you will see here that I've made a huge boo-boo and <laughs> on the worst of all of the pieces to make it onto. <laughs> in that I had stuck everything on the wrong side of this end wall. Because of course the end walls have to be opposite. 
I was working on the principle that, uh, as ever with laser cut things, one side has the burn marks where the laser went through. So I was putting everything on the, on the side that didn't have the burn marks. And that was fatal. Uh, and so I'd also, as you can see, cut out the plastic V-groove that was to go onto the fronts. And it, that was just a nightmare. I got as far as, as putting it all together and then trying to put the end wall on and realizing my mistake. And I'm sorry to say that it, that it spent the night in the bin. Uh, the next day I came back and thought, well, can I, can I save this? And very gently removed all the pieces on the front of the card and was indeed able to uh, get them all off and stick them on the other side uh, and then recut the uh, plastic edging. And I'll put a picture up here which just shows the exterior walls essentially um, with one small omission, which is uh, the, the, the little wall that runs between the two roofs. Uh, it took a bit of while to get the cutting done and it is very fine in places. You need to be very careful when you're getting down to narrow um, parts on some of the plastic. But what that has allowed me to do, uh, I, after I've done this part, now the, the, the plastic you're looking at now has had the first three steps of treatment, which I'm going to go through here and then we'll let everything dry. And then I'll show you how I used the um, uh, weathering powders to provide the end effect. So I'll just move a few things around and then we'll get on with uh, just starting to prep this piece of uh, spare piece of V-groove. The first thing that's got to be done with the V-groove, uh, and I should say I, I looked at various uh, videos about how to get the, the wood effect. Um, so this is an amalgam of things. Uh, and also, having watched uh, Woodland Scenics, not Woodland Scenics, WWS, <laughs> not the same thing at all, um, and how they use weathering powders. I've always been very timid with weathering powders. And the answer is, don't be timid. So the first thing I want to do is to get some relief into this plastic, because it's very smooth. It's, as I said, slightly shiny. And I want to get a wood grain effect when I've finished. And I think if I bring the model in just briefly and bring it up to the window, you can see a grain effect that has gone into the wood, in, into the wood, into the V-groove. And that is because I had I attacked it with one of these things. Now this is obviously just a, a sanding sponge. Uh, rather unhelpfully, um, it says it's coarse or medium but doesn't actually say what the grit value is. Looking on, uh, on the B&Q site, I think the course, which is the one I'm not using actually, is eight, uh, 40 grit and the medium is 80 grit. And what I'm going to do is just sand this very lightly on the top and sand it in one direction only because grain in wood tends, if you're using a single plank of course, uh, to have the grain going only in one way. And I will, um, watch what which way that is because similarly when I'm painting and weathering I'll be trying to work with the grain. So it, it doesn't require much but you just need to rough up the surface. And that, I can see maybe, I don't know whether you can see, I'm not sure whether this is going to pick up. No, I'm not sure it's picking up the grain effect, but I can see that it has, firstly, it's lost its shine. Secondly, you can feel under the hand that it now has a rough top. Uh, there's a bit there that, that it hasn't done, so we'll just do that so it's all done. Right, the next stage is fairly simple, which is to put some primer on it. And not surprisingly, the primer takes really very well because it's got a key to work on. Uh, I tend to use um, Vallejo Surface Primer, which I think it's very, very thin. Uh, and I think it's more intended for an airbrush 
but I rather like it uh, because I don't want too much uh, on the when I'm painting primer on by by brush and this stuff is it's a nice consistency so that's the primer that I use um, and I'll just put the primer on and then I'll let it dry and then I'm going to paint it with some Vallejo silver grey to give me a silvery undertone. Now I'm not going to make you watch me uh, do this painting. Uh, I'll come back when I've after the part the primer's gone on and dried and then I've put one coat of the silver because that's all that goes on is just one coat and when I come back we'll be ready to put the weathering powders uh, on and, and get the final finish because it doesn't take very long to do and I was very pleased with the uh, outcome when it was finished. We're now about six hours uh, later than the last section that you saw. Uh, and you can see that the section that I uh, showed you earlier has now been painted up with the primer and then the silver gray. And I put another piece of um, styrene V-groove in just to show you uh, that the silver gray does actually have some effect. Uh, I don't know whether, again, looking at it as I do here, if I bring this up to the camera, whether you can begin to see better, I'm not sure you can really, uh, the effect of doing the um, sanding. So the next stage is to put a wash on it to try to get some pigment into the various elements uh, on the V-groove. Let me take this one out of the way. And I don't need the silver grey bottle. I saw on the internet um, somebody who was making a wash out of weathering powders. Now the one I'm going to use first of all, I'll move that out of the way because we'll need that a bit later, is the WWS weathering powder Light Earth. And I'm going to get a scoop of that, pop it in there. And then I'm going to add some water. Voila. And uh, I saw someone who strongly recommended a drop of two of um, washing up liquid to help break down the surface tension in the water and to ensure you get a good mix of the, of the weathering powder. And that has now created for me a rather nice brown wash. And I'm going to do nothing more now than give this a complete wash over with that mixture. 
and then I'm going to leave it to dry and it takes about half an hour to dry not much more than that and then uh, we'll get that off and the fun starts with the weathering powders but this whole process of this last section 45 minutes at most uh, because uh, a bit like Henry Cooper showing my age I'm going to splash it all over and just give a good covering over here and again I'm working with the grain of the uh, in which I sanded to try to make sure that I keep all the strokes going in the same direction plenty of it on here thank you very much because most of this is going to come back off again as you will see uh, well in the matter of moments for you but in about half an hour's time for me so with that having been completed I will go away and have a cup of tea or something stronger because it's now the sun is now over the yard arm and uh, I'll come back in about half an hour or so once this is dried. We're now 45 minutes on from when you last saw this and this is completely dried. It's as you might expect a bit sort of powdery to the touch and now what we're going to do uh, is take off most of the colouring that's on there. So just tip a little bit of water onto some uh, tissue and then wipe along it. Oops. And again, working in the same direction all the time, just to take off most of the stuff that's on the top. I'm just going to get a bit there. Right. Oops. There we go again. Right. That's that done. Make sure. <laughs> Let me just check that I've got this the right way around. Yes. So I'll just get another clean piece just to do the final clean and dry everything off. And then we do the powders. I've just uh, recited this into a piece of paper to avoid getting the powder uh, onto the, the working surface because they're devil to get up. So now we do the bit that's quite fun. Um, I'm going to start with the dry soot, or black soot rather, and I'm going to get some of it and put it on here and then start working it with the brush. So it should be enough to, be, to start with. And I'm using a, a, a very stiff flat topped brush here. There's probably a proper name for these things. Stipple brush. Ah, there we go. Uh, let me move this around because it's easy to work. And then just start dragging along with the paper, with the powder and then picking up a bit more. And really, the thing that I've had to learn, uh, apart from <laughs> not dragging it the wrong way, which I just did then, um, is not to be frightened about putting weathering powder on something. Because this process is now going to as I completely cover this in the in the black and you can see why I've put the um, paper underneath when I did the other pieces I didn't put the paper underneath and it took me ages to get this off uh, and stop leaning into things and finding I had black hands now what I'm trying to do now is to get a fairly even coat so I will work over those parts that are still a bit lighter. I wanted a bit more towards the bottom. You can't really see this. Um, a bit more towards the bottom because I think it would be darker than the bottom. But I, I don't want... That's a bit light there. I want to try and get this as even as I can. Let me just bring this back to the centre. That's enough. So now what I'm going to do is we'll just come across here. Right, get that up there. And we don't want any whites left anywhere really, or the silver grey. But that's obviously under there, giving you a tone. And now I will shut the pot of black soot and move to light earth. Thank you. 
and just keep working that until you achieve the color that you want as the finished color. And this is just about coming at just working this until you get the outcome that you really want. Let me just have a look at that. Oh, that's not too bad. Surprised myself that. Okie dokie. So now what I'm going to do. I think that's enough is then if I bring that up to the camera I think now you can get a better idea of a grain in there I think I hope that it's not flat and it does give the look of a wood grain the last stage um, is to put some uh, to seal all that in and for that I just used a acrylic matte varnish uh, which once sealed in it makes it a little bit darker but you can see if I bring the the two together that that's come up pretty much the same so it shows I can repeat <laughs> some weathering and come out with the with the same effect uh, and I'm really pleased with that that's really useful to have uh, to be able to create this effect uh, and a lot of it does come down to just doing a bit of sanding, putting some grain into what is otherwise flat plastic. And I'm amazed to get this outcome with only some one coat of silver grey paint, which is giving an undertone. And all the other effects have been created by using weathering powders. Uh, so with that, let's just go back onto the layout for the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed watching uh, that transformation of a piece of styrene into, I think, a very realistic uh, wood effect, but I would say that because I'm the one that's done it. But really, really learnt a lot uh, having a go with the powders and picking up the various people on the internet that I saw trying to get that effect. I'm really pleased to have got that outcome. Uh, I promised at the start that I'd give you an update on where I am with the water slide transfers. Um, I'm about 75% there, but I don't want to show you anything until I've been able to crack uh, doing them. There is a reason why you don't see many people doing them at home, and it's because it's not that straightforward. Not least uh, that most home printers do not print white. Uh, and that gives you a bit of a problem when you print on absolutely clear water slide transfer paper. If, you, if the thing that you're putting onto is dark, you have a problem, you won't see it. Uh, I'm hoping to get some paper delivered in the next couple of days, which I think will be the right sort of thing to produce the tank as I want it to be. When I do that, I'll, I'll go through the whole process that I've been through and the learning that I have so far in trying to create your own water slide transfers. Uh, it's been fun, I think I'm pretty nearly there. Uh, but I don't want to show you anything just yet, not least because I don't want to reveal the design that is going to be on the side of the tanks taking away the ammonia. One thing I will share with you now uh, are two little wagons that are sitting down here. Uh, and I'll put up here a clip I took earlier which gives you a, a closer look at them, just a 10 second clip. Um, they are by far the oldest things on the layout. I saw them in a shop, they were classed as being Pico because the chassis on which those tanks sit are, have Pico on them. But my little uh, reference book tells me that the tanks themselves are Graham Farish from about 1970. Uh, so there's something of a marriage, but they are exactly the right sort of thing for taking away tar. That's exactly what was used. So I'm really pleased to have acquired those. They've had some new wheels, but otherwise they were absolutely fine. Uh, and I'm not going to play around with the chassis they're sitting on. They all seem to be sitting on there really well. So I've got my little uh, rec tanks that are sitting there waiting to take away the tar. Uh, and I'll return to the work of building the gasworks. I've been doing a lot more um, looking at various gasworks from pictures from the air. Uh, and I'll go into more of a site that's a really useful reference site in the next video. Because 
one of the things I've learned is just the sheer amount of coal there was in a gas works, both coal and separately coke. Uh, and my little couple of staves doesn't really cut it. <laughs> Probably wouldn't get one of the retorts alight. So, uh, more thinking going into the laying out of the gas works. Uh, that really brings uh, this episode and indeed this year's videos to a close. Quite a lot has happened in the year. Um, progress has been made in various areas and indeed in some areas we've gone a bit backwards. But I think overall the progress will be a good one. Thank you for your company through the year, for all of those who've commented and all of those who've uh, subscribed. Uh, it is a real pleasure to do these videos and to get the comments and to be able to respond to them as part of the community of Model Railway or Model Railway Errs. Model, well, yeah, well, anyway, Railway Modelers, that's the way to put it. Uh, I may have had a sip from this glass already. Uh, it only leaves me really to wish you all and your families a very happy new year for 2023. Let's hope it's a healthy one uh, and certainly let's hope that uh, maybe even a prosperous one. But uh, from me to you uh, for 2023, slash.